Good afternoon and welcome to Pay Entry's weekly webinar. Um, this week we will be talking about calculating a, the regular rate of pay when it comes to calculating overtime and are you paying overtime correctly now? I'm Kathy Graham. I'm ahead of the HR services team. Brianna Grimes is here with me today online so she can help with the questions at the end and the uh, both of us are the two that serve you for all your HR services needs. Just remember before we start this, I'm not an attorney, Brianna's not an attorney. So what we're doing today is giving you information and not legal advice. Um, we do have a copy of the handout or a copy of this PowerPoint presentation attached um, on your um, I don't know what you call that, but on where your handouts are on your screen, there is one there for you to take with you today. Otherwise, uh, the recording will be available tomorrow afternoon, and you can look at that on our website. Okay, um, let me just do one thing really quickly, and um, and that is change the PowerPoint because we have an incorrect PowerPoint up here for some reason. And let's just see what we've got and what happened to it. Excuse me for this. I'll be with you in one minute. Looks the same up front, but when you get into it, this is what we want to be talking about. All right, let's talk about calculating overtime correctly, not the stimulus bill that we just talked about earlier this month, although that is an interesting topic. Uh, you came today to hear how to pay overtime. So who has to be paid overtime? That's one of the questions we're going to answer today. What are the general principles? What's included in the regular rate of pay? What can be excluded? And how do you calculate the regular rate of pay? So let's get into this. So who has to be paid overtime? Well, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, requires that all non-exempt or hourly employees be paid for overtime. And there are tests um, on the website. Brianna and I can help you with this if you're not clear or sure whether your employees are non-exempt or exempt. That's something that we can help you with. But it is very important to know whether your employees are non-exempt or hourly because of the overtime rules. Overtime is time worked over 40 hours in a work week, and that is a federal, the federal law. Some states do have another definition for overtime or when you have to pay overtime, including California, Alaska, that's not Alabama, I got that one wrong, uh, Alaska, Nevada, and Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Um, if you um, are in those states, you have to pay overtime for anything over eight hours a day, and there are additional rules and regulations that they have for continuing hours. So it's important to know if you have a state rule that supersedes the federal rule. But today we're going to look at over 40 hours in a work week. Okay, here are the general principles set out by the Fair Labor Standards Act. All compensation for hours worked, services rendered, or performance must be included in the regular rate, and that's the bottom line. So it's not um, just the straight hours worked, it's all compensation. When a payment is a wage supplement, even if it's not directly tied to performance or the hours that someone works, it is still compensation for the hours of employment and must be included. We'll talk a little bit more about what we're what that uh, wage supplements what the wage supplements are in a minute. And the third principle is the determination of whether a payment or a perk or benefit may be excluded is made on a case by case basis. So you can't just lump everything together. So what's included in the regular rate of pay? And this might be surprising to some. It's all compensation provided to the employee as a part of employment. So some things that are included are non-discretionary bonuses like attendance bonuses and um, performance bonuses that are promised, those kinds of bonuses. It also uh, includes commissions, incentive pay, things like perfect attendance award, and shift differentials. 
But the key to this is non-discretionary bonuses um, are many of the things like perfect attendance awards or the things that you deal with that you may not have thought belong as a part of the regular rate of pay. So those have to be counted in when you um, pay them out um, during that work week. So what can be excluded from the regular rate of pay? Well, not a whole lot. One thing is gifts and payments for special occasions, like if you buy an employee a birthday present or you give them something for their years of service. That can be excluded. You don't need to count that. If you reimburse an employee for business expenses or travel expenses, those are not included in the regular rate of pay. And also if you pay for leaves, those are not included in the regular rate of pay. Again, you can exclude the payment or the cost of some convenience items that are provided to employees, like the perks that they get. So for example, if you have an on-site medical care or, or a physician on-site, or you do on-site flu shots, um, things of that nature, those are not included in um, the regular rate of pay. Recreational facilities, wellness programs, Things like employee discounts and parking, whether that be spaces in your lot or um, payment for um, uh, parking uptown. It also does not include tuition payments. So none of those things are included. Discretionary bonuses can be excluded from the regular rate of pay. But there's an if, only if, the bonus is at the sole discretion of the employer. You just walk up to an employee one day and say, I'm gonna give you a $500 bonus. Well, that kind of a bonus can be excluded from the regular rate of pay. If it's tied to any type of performance, like if it's made according to a prior contract, this um, cannot be excluded, but if it's not made according to a prior contract agreement or a promise um, that causes the employee to expect a payment regularly, then it can be excluded. So discretionary, discretionary bonuses are those that are unexpected by the employee. And profit sharing plan contributions can also be excluded. Things like employer contribution to benefit plans, including retirement plans and their health insurance payments, stock options can be excluded, and then premium payments for holidays, weekends, if someone works on the sixth or seventh day of a work week, and only if the premium rate is at least one and a half times the rate of pay for an employee. So if you have an employee who works six days in a row um, and you have a special rate for those sixth or seventh days, then you need to um, not count that. Okay, let's talk about how you calculate this. And I do have um, an example here too, and that will probably help when you have your handout to, to go back to. But the formula for calculating the regular rate of pay is you take the total compensation in the work week and you divide it by the total hours worked in the work week, and that gives you your regular rate of pay for the work week. And that's your basic formula for calculating the regular rate of pay. So take your total comp, divide it by the total hours, and that's the regular rate of pay. So let's look at an example. Okay, Joe's regular rate of pay, whoops, I shouldn't have said that. Joe's rate of pay, I want you to scratch through that regular word um, when you get that, and if I could correct it right now, I would without disrupting everything, but it should say Joe's rate of pay is $10 an hour. One week, he works 45 hours, and he received a bonus of $25 for meeting a production goal. Okay, so Joe's straight-time co compensation for the week 
is $475. You take the 45 hours times $10, which is $450, add 25 to that, and that is his straight time compensation. So that's his total compensation straight time for the week. And here we've just shown it as a formula. Okay, so therefore, Joe's new regular rate of pay is his total compensation divided by his total hours worked. He worked 45 hours, he earned um, $10.55 an hour, so that's $475. Remember his regular rate, or I'm sorry, his rate of pay was $10. But if you divide the number of hours into what he earned, it now becomes $10.55. So his new overtime rate of pay is the regular rate of pay times 1.5, which means his regular rate of pay will now be $15.83. To calculate total earnings, you calculate the regular rate of pay, which is the total compensation earned in the week divided by the total hours worked, and that is $10.55. And that means that that is the new regular rate of pay. So the key here is dividing the number of hours worked by that what was earned in that week. Determine the new overtime rate, which is what we just did. It's 1.5 times $10.55 is $15.83, the new overtime rate. So the total earnings would be straight time earnings plus overtime earnings. So their straight time earnings, or just straight time earnings, was $10.55 times 40 hours. Equals $422. The overtime earnings are $15.83 times five hours. 79.15. So the total earnings for the week would be 50115. So what kind of steps should employers take now that I've, that's probably as clear as mud and it was to me the first time I went through it. Um, it is something that you have to kind of go back and use your own examples to calculate. But just remember, bottom line, you do not use a person's um, normal rate of pay, their, what you, the, the, the rate that you hired them at to calculate overtime. It is not 1.5 times that amount. It's 1.5 times the amount of the regular rate of pay, which calculates in any bonuses or other things that we mentioned earlier. So if you haven't been doing this, don't freak out. What you need to do now is determine what rate is used to calculate overtime at your company and start doing it correctly. If it's not being done correctly, and determine your liability for past violations. Because if you haven't been doing this, you've been breaking the law. And if you are audited, um, there could be um, penalties and interest on the mistakes that you've made. There was a, um, an act called the PAID Act that just expired at the end of January that allowed employers to come forward and um, report their own violations for things like this. That's um, expired. So now if you go forward, you are going to be um, putting yourself in a position of having to go back and make whatever you did wrong um, right. And that could involve, you know, significant fines and penalties. But it's, it's uh, important to determine what your liable liability is for past violations and then create a plan of action for dealing with it. If you're just going to sit tight and hope you never get audited, that's one plan. If you're going to go back and make everyone whole, that was um, where you didn't pay them overtime at the correct rate, then there's going to be a financial liability for that internally. 
and that's something that you have to decide as an organization. If you need help well, with with um, walking through this or talking through this, call Brianna or me, and we'll be happy to help. Right now, I'm going to open it up for questions, and Brianna is going to. I'm going to see if we have any. All right. It looks like we do have a couple questions. Um, we did get a couple questions regarding the PDF. It looks like the PDF that was uploaded was the incorrect was the one. wrong one. So, okay. Yeah. Will, so we'll go I ahead and email that out to everybody. We'll email that out afterwards. Sorry about that. That's all right. So if anybody's looking for that PDF, we'll make sure that we send it out at the end of the presentation so you guys have a copy of it. Um, other questions that we got was, um, based on your example that you provided, would that mean that the regular rate of pay would change weekly based on that calculation? Yes, it could. The following week, if they don't get that $25 bonus or the following pay period, if they don't have that $25 bonus, then the regular rate of pay would be the rate of pay that you hired them um, at what you hired them because there's no add-ins. It's only when so, you have to add in bonuses or commission or anything like that, that it changes the rate that you calculate using for overtime. So if they only are working their regular 40 hours and then overtime hours, their regular rate of pay should be the same as their regular pay. The base base rate of pay. Right. Their base mm -hmm. rate of pay. But right. then if you add in any of that extra stuff, that's when the regular rate of pay would change based on that calculation example. Correct. That is okay. correct. If you add anything else that changes what they earned in the work week. Okay, perfect. Um, another question we got was, if I just enter the number of hours worked in overtime and payroll, does pay entry handle the correct calculation of the regular rate of pay? All right, that's a very good question. And no, they don't. You have to request that. There is um, a um, tweak that has to be done in the system to calculate that because a lot of companies don't ever pay bonuses or commission to their hourly staff. So if you do have that occurring, uh, please reach out to your client advocate and let them know it's called a script that will need to be to placed into your particular um, account that will calculate that correctly. And just to clarify, that's for anybody who's providing bonuses or commissions, that's not for anybody that's providing overtime hours. If it's just Correct. straight overtime hours, you're fine. But you're if fine. you've got any extra pay for non-exempt employees, that's when you would need extra help from your client advocate, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, I've got another question, probably along the same lines, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, so what tools does pay entry provide to help employers calculate the correct overtime rate? Um, number one um, is the system and the script that we offer if you are going to be paying um, other uh, types of bonuses and commission to your employees, the script and then this webinar. Gotcha. Which okay, will be cool. available to on our website tomorrow. Perfect. Um, all right, we have another question. If an hourly or salaried employee works on a weekend for $175, is that considered part of the regular pay? How does this rule affect salaried employees? So it does not affect salaried employees at all because exempt employees are exempt from overtime pay. Does that make sense, Brianna? Yes. So, but if it's an hourly employee and let's say they worked an additional day on a weekend for a flat $175, that would be considered would be part considered, of the regular rate of pay. That is, unless that time that they're working, um, actually you can't segregate the hours that they work on a weekend from the time that they work during the week as hours worked. That's actually could be overtime hours um, because if they added together in a one week period, to more than 40 hours, then you would need to pay overtime for that weekend work. Okay, so they wouldn't be able to pay the flat 175 yeah, rate. Flat. If they're working mm -hmm. on a weekend, they need to include that as overtime hours if it's over 40. Correct, right. You couldn't okay. segregate that out. You would have to pay them um, overtime if it's over 40. Gotcha. Um, all right, and I think we already answered this question. Are any salaried employees that work over 40 hours entitled to overtime? So salaried yeah. employees, like you said, are not eligible for Not overtime eligible. no you are salaried employees are never paid overtime okay all right it's not um, let me back up 
they're, it's not a requirement that you pay them overtime. You can do anything you want, but salaried employees are not should not get overtime because they are being paid a salary, a weekly salary to do their job. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we are a school that has a riding department on campus. We have a, um, a horse stall cleaner uh, that gets paid piece piecemeal per stall cleaned, but she is going to pick up some additional duties that is paid on an hourly basis. Can we do that? So I guess the question is, can they can they pay piece rate for the stalls as well as an hourly basis for other duties? And how do they do that? Yes, you do. And that's a special situation where you need to aggregate the, the, the wages. If I can get the name of the person that has that question, I'll reach back out to them. Sure. Absolutely. But yeah, you can do that. You can have someone doing two different jobs um, and paying them two different rates. You have to aggregate the 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 cost or not the cost, but the wages in order to get an overtime rate. Gotcha. OK, yeah, I'll definitely get that name for you. All right. Another question. If our offer letter states that you might be eligible for a discretionary quarterly bonus, do those bonuses get included in the regular rate of pay? We do pay quarterly bonuses based on profits of the company. Would those affect the hourly rate for the employees who worked overtime in the same week as well? If it's profit sharing, no. Um, if it's based on the profits of the company, it depends. It's, if it's not a productivity bonus, I would say profit sharing would not be included uh, in the regular rate of pay. Yeah, and I think that would depend based on the way the, the question is written. If you state in your offer letter that it's a discretionary mm -hmm. bonus, discretionary. that's different than profit sharing. So it is going right. to be based on how they classify the bonus too. So we may need to right. reach out to um, that person and, and go a little bit more detail. Okay, that yeah, that's a good well. idea. All right. Um, what if we do not run a week by week payroll? Does that change things? No. It doesn't because uh, a work week is stands alone on its own. You have a pay period and you pay for certain um, uh, paid from to date, but there are still work weeks that start on, let's just say Sunday and end on Saturday night at midnight. Um, so a work week is the, the uh, measurement of what um, is over 40. So if they work over 40 in a work week, um, you can't combine two weeks together to see how much overtime they worked. It has to be by week. So if they pay bi-weekly, they would have to calculate the regular rate of pay for each of the two weeks separately rather than dividing by 80 and combining no. it, correct? They would, um, they, they would, yes, they would for that particular. Okay. I mean, they no. don't have to. Let me back up. You don't have to because you have 80 hours in a week. If you know the overtime hours, if it's just 80, you add the, the bonus or whatever it is back into the 80 hours worked. And that would determine it. So it does. It's not narrowed down to 40, but your overtime would be paid based on 40 hours. But if you're calculating total earned, then you lump it into the 80 hours or the 85 hours and calculate it that way. Gotcha. Okay. Um, in California, is overtime pay based only on over 40 hours per week? Does overtime need to be paid at eight hours a day? Um, I think I mentioned that earlier, I think on the first slide, is that California, Alaska, Nevada, um, and a couple of other places have the um, different overtime rules. It is over eight hours a day in California uh, specifically. So yes, you there are different rules in different states, and so you need to make sure that your state um, is in line with the federal law or like California, Nevada, you have different rules. And that would be pay overtime for anything over eight hours a day. Yep. Um, next question, how would you know how many hours were on the weekend? If it's an on-call basis, taking calls if they come in, there's not necessarily hourly tracking. Well, the, if it's a non-exempt employee, you should be tracking their hours for the time that they spend working. Brianna, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, I think you have to track their hours, even if it is on call. Yes, and, and depending on what state you're in, there also may be an on-call minimum. So I know, I think, for example, in California, if you have someone on call, you have to pay them a minimum hourly sal salary, regardless of how many hours they work, if you're going to have them on call. Um, so again, this may be another one we need to reach out to this 
this uh, client and get a little bit more details because there may be some state specific laws because mm -hmm. on call is treated a little bit differently um, than like a standard scheduled shift. It so, is, and I did read somewhere where on call um, may be excluded from that additional um, regular um, rate of pay calculation. So let's reach back out to that person. Okay, sounds great. Another question, we only pay semi-monthly and we pay out an attendance bonus for those who are eligible on a quarterly basis. How would you do that calculation? Ugh, that's just a miserable <laughs> question. You do have to go back retroactive and calculate what you would have paid the person um, during that quarter for overtime based on the quarterly attendance bonus. It's a retroactive calculation. Mm -hmm. to see if you have anyone whose overtime rate needs to be adjusted. That's why I said UGG. So in that instance, would it be better for them to calculate the attendance bonus on a weekly basis, but then only pay it out quarterly, but be calculating it on an ongoing weekly basis so they make sure they pay at the correct rate? Um, there's no way really um, to establish whether the bonus is being awarded or not until the end of the quarter. So really there's no way to do that except to make a retroactive adjustment to anyone's pay that had overtime during that time. Okay. Um, okay, so this was kind of a follow-up to one of the previous questions. They're not considering it profit sharing for that bonus on their offer letter. It is a discretionary bonus. So in that case, if it is a discretionary bonus, it would can be that excluded. affect? No, it, can be it can be excluded, be excluded then? Excluded. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. only the non-discretionary bonuses that have to be included. Okay. Um, another question, since this is something new, how far back would you need to go to be compliant? What of employees, what of employees who have moved and no longer work for the company? Okay, well, first of all, this is not anything new. It's been around since overtime started. It's just that employers um, are not on top of it. Um, so there's, a, you're not, if you're doing it wrong, you're not the only one that's doing it wrong. So it doesn't make it right, but this has been around forever. The thing of it is, is that um, if you have people that have left your company, you know, there's chances are you're not going to be able to find them anyway. You just, normally, the, if the Department of Labor comes in to do a wage and hour audit, um, they're going to look at your, you know, who you have currently and how far back you went and how how you tried to correct it, what kind of efforts you made. They may still look at those people who are gone, but um, as long as you take care of the people that you have, and remember, I'm not an attorney, so you just do the, your, the best that you can, the best effort that you can to make those people who did not get paid correctly um, satisfied or made whole. Yeah, and, and just to tack on to that, there are some states that are a lot more strict with these types of claims. Um, for example, California is definitely one of them. Oh, yeah. um, and a lot of times when an employer is in California or even New York and Washington get audited, uh, the Department of Labor can force you to pay back penalties and back mm -hmm. pay to any and all employees up to three years. So this mm -hmm. is definitely something if you guys are doing it incorrectly now, let's correct it and make sure you do it going forward. Um, in three years, you'll be in the clear. The Department of Labor can't make you back pay any further than that by federal law, um, but that is definitely something to keep an eye out for when you are considering the liability is let's fix it now moving forward um, and just make sure that we're not incurring any more possible years of potential back pay if you ever get audited. Right. All right, well, that was all the questions, Kathy. Okay, well, that was those were good questions, and we will follow back up with those that we um, spoke about earlier. Um, you, I will send you a copy of this um, presentation immediately after the session is over, and um, if you still have questions and you want to reach out to um, one of us, um, just send an email um, to, you. Can, I've got my email address up here, but you can use HR services, at payentry.com. I need to change that on here, but HR services at payentry.com and either Brianna or I will answer your questions.
thank you for attending today and um, hopefully we have answered some of your questions hopefully we didn't give you a really bad case of indigestion and um, right after lunch here so let us know if we can help thanks and have a great day